Okay. <clears throat> uh, so tomorrow I have an exam on this very subject, probability statistics and data visualization. I'll be just doing the uh, the probability part and not all of this statistics, data visualization, not doing it. Uh, yeah. So these are the notes from our instructor. Uh, let's let's go through them. Contents. I don't need to look at that. What is this set theory? No, no need. We pretty much know everything about it. But okay, fine. We'll still read through it. Universal set. We know any subset. Fine. It's just notation. First of all, it's just notation. Okay. Proper subset. Each element is a distant. Uh, does not matter. Whatever. What is this? Null set. Complement. Simple set. Union. Fine. Commutative property for unions and intersection. Fine. Associative property. Got it. Distributive property. A union B intersection C equal to A union B intersection uh, A union C. Uh, at first, seems not very intuitive. Like, not very clear how this happened, right? Uh, okay, let's read it like this. Every element that is in A and every element uh, that is in B and C. Okay, that is just basically every element that is in A or B and every element that is in A or C. So you're taking A union this anyway, right? So you're including all of A pretty much. And then you're doing B intersection C. Uh, and over here too, you'll be actually doing B intersection C. So like this, this can be thought of as like A plus B kind of in a, in a way. Uh, how do I even say this? Um, I don't know if there's like a proper way to be explaining this. I guess I could explain it using a Venn diagram. So you know you got this Venn diagram. That's the most generic one, right? A could be intersecting B or it could be intersecting C. Like it could not be, but whatever. This is the most general case. So B intersection C is just this thing. A unions like okay, this is A. This thing is B. This thing is C. B intersection C is just this, and. A union of that would be like you are including A and everything that is in B intersection C. So this is also they claim uh, to be A intersection B and wait so okay A union B fine which is all of this stuff I mean all of this right and A intersection uh, sorry A union C all of that stuff they want the intersection of that which yeah i mean look at where the boundaries cross this is the this is the set basically uh i want a more fo formal proof for this thing or is it just like some kind of axiom i don't know um how would we do this mm, boolean logic some, some other stuff well think about it Hey, we can always do a truth table, right? So for some element E, if that is in this set, like, yeah, okay. So the truth table will be, will be uh, based on A, B, and C. So you got something like this. So is, um, so like the truth table will basically be is some element E uh, belonging. Okay, let's just uh, call it small x, okay. So is some element x belonging to a this will return a, a boolean statement so like a true or false something like that where uh, yeah basically that's what thing will be and um uh, so like if it returns a true statement for this thing this complete thing then i'll just say that yeah that x actually belongs to this set okay so first we'll just write down all the values for um these truth Okay, it, uh, these boolean values. Why am I <laughs> boolean values? It should just be true, false values, truth values. That's that's the thing. That's the mathematical word. Boolean is from uh, computer science. No need for understanding what a boolean is. Okay, so let's go. True, 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 true. You will need four of these, and then false, 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 and then this would be true, true, false, false. I mean, this is the most uh, basic way of doing it, I guess. True, false. True, false, true, false, true, false. All right, and based on this, we'll see um, how will these two sets uh, work. So A union B intersection C. So like what we have is X is in B and so like for example, for the first one, 
uh, x is in a b and c so it's like it's like okay x is in b so instead of b we'll just write true and instead of intersection we'll write um, and c so it's like true and true that's true <sighs> this is still weird isn't it yeah um, so how, like how is b intersection c formally defined it's it's the it's like the set of all elements that belong to b and c so does x belong to b and c yes it does if it's true true right so anywhere that you will encounter a, even a single false this will be false all right so yeah and then a union this stuff it's like does x belong to a or x belong to this so if x belongs to a we are good or if x belongs to this we are good so everywhere over here when we have true 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 over here you will also have true 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 so let me just write that down so a union i should write the whole statement x belongs to a union <coughs> b intersection c so this is like a very stepwise manner of thinking about it like you're making eight cases and thinking what happens if x is like this what happens if x is like that stuff like that right yeah so everywhere that we have true so if it's a part of a then it's definitely gonna belong to this because it's a union something so this is true 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 uh i should have put some something like grid lines i don't know so true 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 the so first four are true okay next for this uh, it's a bunch of false like false and something is always that something itself so now x does not belong to a so the question is does it belong to be inter uh, to be intersection c and um, it will belong to be intersection c if it belongs to both b and both c that is x belong to b and x belong to c both must be true so you will only get a true uh, over here everywhere else you will just get a false because it does not belong to the other set that makes sense right so you'll just have a true over here and everything else is just false 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 okay uh that's for this uh and like okay instead of writing x belongs to and stuff i'm just gonna write this thing itself for now but yeah okay and what about this i'm just gonna insert something over here this should be a union b um intersection of a union c so once again think of union as or right so first we'll think of these two sets itself so like if x along, uh, belongs to a then it definitely belongs to either of these two sets because it's a union something so uh, the first thing would be true and second thing would be true and then it's like and so true and true this is of course true right i mean come on this is normal logic i don't even know how to formally do this but this makes sense <laughs> in my head at least um so yeah like okay if x belongs to a right then doesn't matter if it belongs to b or not or if it belongs to c or not it does belong to a union b and it does belong to a union c so it does belong to the intersection of these two sets right yeah um so wherever you have true over there this should be true right you will just have true over here as well <laughs> right and if it does not belong to a then we have to ask the question does it belong to b does it belong to c right so then a union b i mean okay yeah like okay fine so if it does not belong to a and it belongs to b so you know you have these two true things then this first thing this first set it contains x because it's in uh, b right um and then it's like true and something so this is just this thing itself so like if it belongs to c good this is this set also contains x so that intersection contains x if it doesn't it doesn't in fact in general if either of these two sets does not contain x the intersection can't contain x so that means if it doesn't belong to either of b or c yeah you basically you basically get like um how do i call it uh, a false yeah so this would be true because over here it belongs to both b and c and over here there's at least one set which it does not belong to so it's just false 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 and this makes perfect sense right 
and now yeah at least now it makes perfect sense and similarly like a intersection b union c that's equal to a union b union a intersection c so instead of doing all of this formal stuff you could have always gone with a pen diagram <laughs> that's just a better thing to do right yeah i mean look at it it covers all eight cases count the number of regions it has one two three four five six seven and then the eighth case would be when it does not belong to any of them which is the other part of the universal set so you know s minus or like okay a union b union c conjugate it's called conjugate complement complement is the word fine okay makes sense what about this one a intersection of b union c so b union c is just uh, this complete thing a intersection of that is this area okay that's equal to a intersection b which is this thing this area and a uh, intersection c this so their union which of course yeah is the is the same thing visually you can see that so i won't be doing the truth table thing for that okay let's move on now i mean i don't know if this is actually the formal stuff but it looks formal enough to me right i mean what more could, could you do to actually like definitely prove that yeah that these two sets are the same i don't know it can't get more formal than that we just made into a bunch of cases which are uh, non overlapping right yeah okay de morgan's laws uh, a union b complement equal to a complement intersection b complement let's draw the venn diagram again so the universal set a b so a union b is this complete thing that complement is this complete thing right yeah okay and you know what i should probably be using some other thing okay and a complement intersection of b complement so a complement would be this thing so you have yeah everything except of a and then from that you're like intersecting with b complement so b complement would just be let's take another color uh would be this so wherever these uh, shades intersect that's that's our area that we want right and now where do these oh, of course it's also we it's also going to be like okay so it's surrounding b it seems fine so where do the shades intersect wherever you have the darker shade which is in this area particularly yeah which is yeah a, a union b complement that's pretty much what the law says and you can see that visually okay uh i don't want any of that delete this yeah delete this delete everything okay and a intersection b complement so intersection b is just this thing that complement would be everything else like all of this right okay that's equal to a complement union b complement so a complement is all of this I mean everything surrounding a so like this stuff and b complement and you want the union of these guys right okay so i'm going to do both in the same color in that case so b complement is all of this all right so wherever it's not shaded that's not in our set everything else is in our set so except for this little region everything else is in the set which is yeah i mean exactly the same thing because this is a intersection b so that complement sure next a minus b equal to a minus a intersection b makes sense sure i mean you don't even have to prove this at this point and i guess this would be better proved using like truth table so you could have something like this x belongs to a x belongs to b uh x belongs to this thing which i'm just going to write like a union b complement and not going to write x belongs to that or anything because you know we are running out of space okay so let's think about it if this is true this is uh this can have two values right true false true true false false just four cases okay cool so if x belongs to a and x belongs to b that's our first case then a union b x yeah belongs to that thing of course in fact a union b so like it doesn't matter i mean if it belongs to any of these 
you are good to go. So for all three of these cases, you'll just get a true, right? Uh, for A union B, and then that thing complemented. So X belongs to A union B in all these three cases, which means it does not belong to its complement, right? Or it's excluded from its complement. Uh, so these would just be false, 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 false. And over here, it's not in this thing. So we know like universal set contains X, otherwise we can't talk of the element X, right? So then if it's not contained in the set, it must be con uh, contained in its complement, which means this is true. Makes sense, right? Okay. Uh, what about A complement? So just uh, turn all of these, uh, the opposite basically. So like true becomes false, false becomes true, stuff like that. And then once again, just taking the intersections, that's like an and basically. So it has to belong to A complement and B complement, right? So for example, for the first one, it's false and false. So false. Then it's like false and true. So false and then false again. And in this particular case, it's true and true. So it's true. Makes sense. So actually like the first time I heard about uh, this D Morgan's law stuff is from Boolean logic and that's why I'm writing set as Boolean logic but I guess you could do the inverse as well. I don't know. This just seems more formal basically because you are breaking into cases that you can speak in words. Well whatever. Here you are speaking through a picture, there you are speaking through words, doesn't make a difference, you are telling the same thing. Okay. All right, let's prove this thing. A minus B equal to A minus A intersection B. Come on, I don't even need to prove this. You already know it's true. But still, okay, so what's A minus B? A minus B is just this region. And this is of course A minus it is A intersection B because A intersection B is uh, this region. So like, yeah, it sure is just A, this complete thing minus this region. Makes sense. I mean, quite literally, just minus that. And for like A minus B, that is a different thing. Because like, it's just, it's just, you know, subtracting this stuff. Okay. Hey, is this like a definition? I don't think it's the definition for A minus B, but it could be. You could define it like that. I don't know. Okay, that's equal to A intersection B complement. So sure, B complement is just, well, first of all, I'm gonna uh, delete this. So like B complement is this set and you want a intersection of that. So you can think of it like all the elements of A in B complement. So in B complement, look for elements of A, that's only this area. There you go, proved. Okay, S union A equal to S, come on, I'm not gonna prove this. S intersection A equal to A, I really don't want to be proving this. Okay, yeah, whatever, prove it yourself. <laughs> Then the set can be classified as countable or uncountable. A countable set could be finite or infinite. So a finite countable set is like, I don't know, one, two, three, four till nine or something. An infinite countable set is like the integers, rational numbers, whole numbers, natural numbers. If you don't know why rational numbers are countable, you can always do something like this. You can do something like this. One, um, Okay, so like one upon one, you could you could make a table like this. So one upon one, one upon two, one upon three, so on. Over here, you just got like two upon one, uh, three upon one, so on. Over here, it would be like two upon two. But guess what? Two upon two can be reduced, so we won't be considering that, right? So two upon. I'm still gonna write that actually. Uh, yeah, two upon two. Then it's like two upon three, and so on. And this is like three upon two, and so on, right? Uh, and of course, the ones where you don't have the GCD equal to 1 for numerator and denominator, you won't be considering that because those are already counted before. Those are reducible, right? So they must have been counted already. And yeah, so this looks good. Now what you do is you go in this zigzag manner, right? You just do, yeah, like the first diagonal and then the second diagonal and then the third diagonal and so on. So you can sure count it. I mean, look at it. You are literally counting it. One, two, three, four, five, so on, <laughs> whatever. Right? So you can always go by diagonals and then you are basically counting all of rational numbers. Makes sense, right? So you are basically mapping. Um, how do I say this? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that looks like the way. So you are mapping your rational numbers to integers. 
right? And I know this is not like a function map where, where you have like a proper function and I mean it is basically. It's from integers to this, but like, okay, you can't express this using piecewise or elementary functions. Maybe you can using like infinite piecewise functions, I don't know. But it is basically a relation, so it's also a function because like one goes to one upon one. It's like two goes to one upon two, stuff like that. So it is a function, but like that's it, I don't know. Move on. Hey, it's, it's like even bijected because you're going the reverse. I guess, kind of. Thing is like both of these are different sizes of, I mean, you can't really compare infinities at this point fine so yeah just leave it like that so it's just a fact it happens so that rational numbers are countable and irrational numbers are not countable so their union is of course an uncountable set okay now what is this uncountably infinite set uh-huh irrational numbers real numbers stuff whatever Okay, probability space. Ha, huh. we changed from set to probability. Fine. Random experiment. So now we know all of this set stuff. You know about disjoint set and okay, probability. So the universe S that is now becoming the sample space S. The element A belonging to S it's now becoming an outcome or sample point S belonging to S subset of universe a that's now an event so this is a weird thing usually the way it's done is like i mean when i say usually that's uh, in like school textbooks uh, in the school textbooks these outcomes themselves are events right but in this case you are making a more general definition of an event which is like a set containing multiple outcomes so if any of those outcomes happen you say it's an event so for example you roll a dice and then your event would be that the number is even that's an event and the outcomes would be one two three four till six right and then like favorable outcomes two four six so on whatever right <sighs> makes sense so in fact no like in school text as well e is actually a subset of s it's not an element of s right so yeah okay this is an outcome of our uh, random experiment i guess that makes sense sure and usually you are dealing with numbers but then you could also be dealing with these weird things ht you know ideas a set of ideas i don't know how to how do you even do that but yeah that's basically how it is okay like a set could really contain any kind of object that you want it could contain matrices and whatnot right it could contain dates it could contain whatever uh, but yeah usually it will be containing numbers because you know maths <laughs> okay outcome or sample point whatever subset of universe that's an event null set it's an impossible event sure simple set so a simple set is basically like what i was telling about before so i think i got confused between those i don't know fine so simple set is just another event where there's only one um thing in your set so it's cardinal is one fine simple event i mean okay it's the same stuff uh disjoint sets mutually exclusive sure okay so they have taken an example a coin toss so the sample space is either heads or tails the outcomes would be heads uh, or tails i mean yeah that's just how it is these are the outcomes you just said that you just said that elements are the outcomes you don't have to write that and why what what's with this arrow stuff i don't know okay so the events are it's so like okay you throw a you throw it wait wait a second the outcomes are this thing what's what is this oh okay so like the way you would put this in words is the first event is when nothing happens so does this actually happen no it's impossible something has to come right there there should be at least some outcome over here there's like really just no outcome is does, doesn't make sense it's, it's breaking the it's breaking the experiment itself like the experiment has to give some outcome 
this is not an outcome okay i mean this is like having nothing in it so of course zero probability of that happening even is the event that head occurs so the head is our outcome e2 is the event that tail occurs that tail is our uh, outcome for our experiment and s is the event that either of head or tail occur right yeah Sure, makes sense. I mean, like S is just union of E one E two, so that this could be read it like read like that. Either of head or tail occurs. Okay, or you could say any of the elements in this set occur, or are the outcomes or whatever. <clears throat> Die toss. Uh, S equal to this events. Two power six equal to sixty four. What? Two power six. Oh, so the, okay, okay, like, fine, 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 fine. Number of events that you could define based on this uh, sample space. So that is the number of subsets, of course, which is two power six, because like every element could be in that element in that uh, event or not. So it's two choices. So two power six because six elements. Okay, simple events. You got all of this. Uh, why are they writing all of this? This is not important. Axioms of probability. Probability of any event is bigger than or equal to zero, and the uh, second axiom is that probability of the sample space is one. So, yeah, it has to happen. Like something has to happen, and everything that could happen is in the sample space. So its probability is of course one. Okay, if E one and E two are mutually exclusive, E one intersection of E two equal to uh, phi. So that's a that's an axiom. I was thinking that's like. This is a very roundabout way of saying it. Mutually exclusive is by definition this, right? Yeah. I mean, this is just the definition of mutually exclusive set. So, why even think of that as an axiom? Oh, okay, no, okay, this is not like, oh, this is not related to that. It's just saying the same thing, in fact. So, if even e two are mutually exclusive, that is this equation holds. Then, so this is the actual thing. This is our axiom: probability of e one union e two equal to probability of e one plus probability of e two. Okay, I get why this could be an axiom. Can you actually like disprove this or prove this somehow? I don't know. Hey, this is very weird. Uh. I mean, yeah, this has to be an axiom because the fact that you can split your probability thing on these two events, it comes out of nowhere. It looks like it's true, but we haven't proved it. How would you even prove it? I don't think I should spend time trying to prove this. It's an axiom, right? Yeah, there's a reason it's an axiom because nobody has been able to prove it uh, just from all of these axioms. Okay. Axiom 3a. If all of these are mutually exclusive events, then of course this happens. I mean, that is the definition. Then, probability of the union of all of these mutually exclusive events, that's just the sum of the individual probabilities of our elements. Makes perfect sense. And in uh, 3b, they're just taking the limit to uh, infinity. So, like n goes to infinity. So, it's like uh, an infinite set, infinite sample space, whatever. Uh, then still you have the same thing. Okay, there's a corollary. So we have to. Okay, you know what? I'm not gonna prove this. Not sorry. Uh, I'm not gonna look at the proof. Okay. So what we have to prove is prove is that a probability of some event is less than or equal to one. Of course, of course. So, I mean, this doesn't look that bad. Think about it. You got some event contained in our sample space, and there's like the event complement, right? And these two are mutually exclusive by definition because like. Yeah, that's just the way it is. It's every element of S which is not an element of E. So it's not an element of E. That's the important point. So these are mutually exclusive, which means that probability of sample space, which is probability of this union that, right? So probability of sample space, which is to just one, that's equal to probability of E union uh, E complement, which are mutually exclusive. So it's just a probability of uh, E plus the probability of E C. Right, 
and we just assumed that every probability is bigger than or equal to zero. So we know that this thing is bigger than or equal to zero. So that just means P E is yeah, less than or equal to one because because like one minus P E is bigger than or equal to zero. So P is less than or equal to one. Makes sense. Okay. That's proved. Yeah, I don't want to be looking at your proof. Corollary two, probability of null set is equal to zero. So the same thing, in fact, the same thing, except that now E C is just um, S itself. So probability of S is actually one. So like one, one cancel out, just get probability of E equal to zero. The way it is. <laughs> yeah, the same stuff happening over there as well. Corollary three, for any event E1, E2, probability of E1 union E2 equal to probability of E1 plus E2 minus E, okay, all that stuff. Hey, so uh, first did we actually prove this thing? It's like E1 uh, union E2 is equal to E1. Wait, how would I actually do this? I don't know. These are not mutually exclusive. That's a weird thing going on, isn't it? Uh-huh. Intersection E2. Oof. This is rather weird. You could prove this numerically because, yeah, but, but like without letting things overlap, this wouldn't make sense. Wait, could it somehow make sense? Probability of E1 minus probability of E1 intersection E2. What is E1 minus E1 intersection? Oh, it's just E1 minus E2, isn't it? And we know like E1 minus E2 and E2 are just mutually exclusive. Oh, it, he's doing the same thing. He's really just doing the same thing, in fact. Yeah, look, E2 and E1 minus E2 are mutually exclusive. So then you can break this. And then it's just probability of E1 minus E2 plus probability of E2. And probability of E1 minus E2 is in fact just, you know, uh, how do I even say this? I mean, okay, E1 minus E2, that's the same thing as E1 minus E1 intersection E2, right? That was uh, before in, in, in there somewhere. And then the thing is like, okay, I don't think I have to be doing all that. The visual proof is good enough. Like probability of E minus E2 is just probability of E1 minus probability of E1 union E2, right? Because E1 is made up of E1 minus E2 and E1 union E2. So probability of E1 is probability of E1 minus E2 plus probability of E1 I'm, why am I saying union? Should be intersection. E1. So what I'm saying is like probability of E1 is the same thing as probability of E1 minus E2 uh, union. So okay, this set E1 minus E2 union E1 intersection E2. Right? These two are mutually exclusive. So this is just probability of E1 minus E2 plus the probability of E1 intersection E2. So from there you can just get E1 minus E2 probability is equal to probability of E1 minus probability of E1 intersection E2, right? Oh, so he got that in this uh, equation. And then he used the fact that E1 union E2 can basically be written as, you know, E1 minus E2 union E2, right? Yeah. And then E1 minus E2 is like mutually exclusive to E2. So you can break this thing into probability of E1 minus E2 plus probability of E2. And then probability of E1 minus E2, you just pull that from here and yeah, you get the thing. So doable, very doable. All you have to do is just break the union into two parts, which are mutually exclusive and then you can do it. Okay. Next, they're going to sample space, uh, space which is discrete or continuous. So it's discrete, there are countable outcomes, continuous and countable outcomes. For events E and F such that E is just a corollary. So if a, uh, E is a proper uh, subset of F, then probability of E, sorry, uh, probability of E is less than or equal to probability of F. Sure, makes sense. Because like F will be written as E plus F minus E. Okay, it's just saying plus I should say. So okay, F equal to E union F minus E. He's doing the same thing, isn't he? I'm not looking, okay? I'm seriously not looking, so I won't know what he's doing. And then you just apply the probability on these two sets. Now, since E and e, F minus E are like mutually exclusive, you can break this. It's a probability of E. 
plus the probability of f minus b. Now we know every probability is bigger than or equal to zero, so there you go, probability of e is less than or equal to probability of f. Easy. Yeah, the same stuff over there. Single switch, what, what is all of this? How did we change from this probability stuff to switch? Uh huh. Okay, that came out of nowhere. Single switch, it has half probability of what? What even is our event in this case? I guess the event is like the current flowing. So probability of the event where current flows, that would be half. That's gonna assume the fact that you have equal probabilities for the two events that current is not flowing and current is flowing, but fine. Okay, then two switches in parallel. So now what's our event? I guess the event is current is flowing from here to here. Doesn't matter what magnitude of the current is, but yeah, it is flowing. Then in three fourth cases, it's gonna move, makes sense. Two switches in series. It's just one fourth, so there's only one case out of the four cases that you can have where the current is moving. Okay. I don't know why he did all of this, but fine. I don't know. You must be discussing something else and then like jumped into a tangent or something. Anyway, next you have this thing probability of E1 union, E2 union, E3. Why even put a bracket? Union is associated anyway, right? Just put E1 union, E2 union, E3. That is. Oh, now that's inclusion exclusion principle, isn't it? Are we gonna prove that or okay, okay, I don't think we have to prove it. But what if you do have to prove that then that would be a problematic thing. Ah Honestly, yeah. Um Okay, you could always draw this visual and then you could do all of this overlapping stuff and yeah, sure, that makes sense. It's just inclusion exclusion principle basically. Usually that's done for like number of elements in E1 union, E2 union, E3, where E1, E2, E3 are sets. Right, that would be just number of elements in E1 plus number of elements in E2 and all that stuff. Here you're seeing probability because number of elements upon sample space so yeah the coordinate of the sample space that is uh denominator is common distribute it and there you go you get the probabilities sure 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 i get all of this but why like how would you formally prove this or like generalize this in fact because you know the actual inclusion exclusion principle is more general than that right you could have multiple events and then it's gonna be like, for so example, if you like put the fourth event over there, then it's like probability of E1 plus probability of E2 plus probability of E3 plus probability of E4 minus all of the probabilities of like E1, EI intersection uh, EJ, stuff like that, right? And then plus the probabilities of EI intersection EJ intersection EK, right? Yeah. Mm hmm. So like the way I usually think of this in problems is, so think of E1, E2, E3 being rules, okay? And all the elements in E1, E2, E3 being the cases where those rules are broken, okay? So what's the probability of um, somebody breaking E1 rule? Yeah, so, like E1 is the event that the rule E1 is broken, then Probability of E1 is just that event's probability, right? So what's E1 union E2 union E3? That's just like one of the rules have, okay, so it's like at least one rule has to be broken. That's the thing. So that would be, okay, all the cases where you're breaking one rule, but in a loose way. So you're taking like overlapping intervals and all that, so, you know, for, for okay, so you just take like first the case where you're breaking E1, then you're breaking E2, then you're breaking E3. So all of these individually, right? That minus of 
all of the cases were breaking uh, E1 and E2. All those individually, of course. And then that plus the cases were breaking. Um, this is kind of weird, isn't it? Yeah. So like, if I just told, if yeah, like you, you, you could like prove this recursively, I guess. So all of this part, negative of it, in fact, would be just uh, the probability that more than one rule is broken, right? Yeah. It's kind of a weird thing to to do, actually. Yeah, it's just it's just weird. More than two, look, more than one rules broken and stuff. The visual explanation is just much better. I don't know how to recursively make this general or something, but I'm gonna do that later. First, I just have to read all of this. Okay. Sample space discrete and continuous. Countable in the teachers. Okay, countable real numbers. Probability function for continuous sample space. Okay, so you define an event as all x such that x is between a and b. So the dart goes on all these values of x, right? The event that it goes in either of like any of these values, any of the values in the set x such that x is between a and b. That's our event e. So the sample space is this thing. So we know that dart has to go um, on this green line. So the event E is that it goes in a specific range A to B. Then since all outcomes are equally likely, I know it's supposed to be uncountably many um, things over here, but you know, you get like a feel for it that, yeah, um, all outcomes are equally likely. So like intervals of same length would be having same probability, right? It kind of makes sense. So then, you, you can split uh, S and E into a bunch of smaller intervals, right? Uh, yeah, so that the boundaries are also the boundaries of two uh, such consecutive intervals. Boundaries of E that is, okay. And then you could always do, um, you know, like break E into those sets and do the, uh, do the sum of the probabilities of these individual sets, right? And yeah, so then S would of course be like also the so the probability of S is also uh, just the sum of all of these sets uh, that S is made up of. So the number of sets that S is made up of that will go out in the denominator, right? And the probability of one set well, that's gonna get cancelled anyway. So in the numerator, we'll just have probability of that one set times number of sets uh, that E is made up of. So Basically, what what you get in the fraction is just number of sets in E upon number of sets in L, and these are proportional to the length of E and length of S. So length of E is just B minus A, length of S is one, so it's just B minus A upon one, which is B minus A. I talked a lot. I didn't uh, write anything because it's not worth writing it. Okay. A one probability of E is bigger than or equal to zero. Probability of E equal to B minus A bigger than or equal to zero as B is bigger than A. Come on, come on, seriously. We just said b is bigger than a then how can we be equal to zero if there is something in there and you're saying equal probabilities then it has to be bigger than zero he may just made a mistake i guess i mean it is of course bigger than or equal to zero but you you could write bigger than zero what's the big deal okay probability of s equal to one probability of s equal to uh yeah i don't want to do all of that he's probably just working through some example i don't want to be doing it what is A1, A2, A3? Are these, oh, these are answers of some question, which he didn't write on the board for some reason. Not gonna do all of that. Okay, probability function of discrete sample space. Assume all outcomes are equally likely. <clears throat> okay. So for example, toss a die, it's a fair, uh, it's a fair experiment where all outcomes are equally likely, right? And you could also toss an unfair die where all the outcomes are not equally likely. So like, instead of having one, two, three, four, five, six, you actually have one, two, three, four, five only, and like five is on two faces. So the outcomes would be, you get one or two or three or four or five, but you get five 
twice as many times then wait what is this yeah okay twice as many times as any other number so the yeah out that outcome is like unfair so probability function of discrete sample space that's probably just you know for each element you have different probabilities makes sense okay combinatorics why okay persisting ordered without replacement what without replacement npk permuting k huh what is he talking about what replacement oh so there's no repetition that's what it's saying i don't know one permutation equal to arrangement to two yeah sure okay oh replacement oh so like the order matters wait but he already uses uh, uses the word order so what is this replacement stuff okay he also has an order with replacement thing then that's an example okay fine unordered sampling without replacement it's nck okay i guess yeah replacement by the that is basically means like there are no repetitions of our elements okay ordered sampling with replacement so n balls in an urn and n b okay 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 i get it there are n balls in an urn there are n b black balls and n r red balls okay sample m uh balls without replacement oh so from this you just want to have a sample of m balls basically right so now there is a there is like a replacement because all of these red balls are identical i guess k red balls out of m black balls this is very weird ha huh? k red balls out of m black balls wait okay so out of the m balls that you have now taken right okay what's the probability i mean okay for the matter being you could always think of these being uh, distinct balls right sure all these are red they fall in the category red but think of them as being distinct i guess yeah so when you saying it's ordered okay 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 so from n you just want to permute k balls and then in some permutations you will have some wait what exactly k red balls what is he doing okay so he's first choosing k out of m then there's like n r k uh what is you need to again in this n minus k what's this subscript over there it's not the n choose m subscript it's some weird thing going on did he actually explain the subscript no he did not N C K equal to N. Okay, what is did it he? Oh, this is a uh, permutation. Fine, so he's using this notation for permutation. Okay, nice that I did it right now, so that I don't have to do this, figure this out in the exam itself. Fine, so then he's permuting K balls out of N R balls, and he's also permuting M N S K. Uh huh. the order matters okay 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 i get it i get it so because each outcome is equally likely right our balls are actually uh, unique in fact so like everything has a label on it or something like that so what he's doing is he's uh, splitting our uh, you know m ball thing so like that we have to take a sample of m balls he's first of all figuring out k positions where you have to put the red balls 
for those k positions he is permuting these red balls n r of these into our k positions is permuting our n b balls into the m r s k positions and that's the number of ways that you can have this event happening m c k because you can have like multiple arrangements for these positions things yeah okay and that's what this stuff which is n r c k n b m r s k upon n choose m why did i write like that i don't know oh so now it's a different format huh fine mm -hmm. let's see what this guy is doing so first he's just permuting k next is permuting n minus k of these wait he's not permitting he's actually choosing he's choosing k okay it's weird because that's actually a lesser number so how did he get a bigger number somehow something doesn't make sense i mean nrck should be a bigger number right uh, sorry it should be a smaller number than nr <sighs> Which of them is a bigger number? I think this one is a bigger number, right? Yeah. It's like this has the k factorial in the denominator and stuff, and this has the m s k factorial in the denominator. Oh, that's that's from this thing. So you you actually have k factorial in minus k in the denominator over there, and then you have m factorial. Is doing n c m. Wait, what even is this thing? He just did n e, right? No wait, this this has to be like the probability because oh that's kind of weird, isn't it? What's our sample space? So the sample space is like from all these n balls. You just want like k, so you're just permuting. Yeah, it's just that stuff. So in the denominator, you're gonna have like n factorial upon n minus k factorial okay something like that oh okay oh, oh yeah like you're permitting m sorry not k because it doesn't matter now you don't need that restriction of k red balls that's just for this event in the general sample space you could have like k plus one red balls or whatever you just have to have m balls right so our experiment is of course is sampling m balls our outcome is you know the tuple of those m balls yeah and our event is that the tuple has k red balls exactly so the set of all such tuples that's our uh, event right so yeah he actually did thing he's like doing um so he's doing npm over there in the denominator sure so yeah just just uh, this thing is actually is the probability it's not n of e I don't know why I didn't write probability of E or something, but this is not the N of E thing. It's just a probability. Okay. And then some stuff cancels out. Okay. And then he eventually gets this thing. More like instead of saying cancel out, it just rearranges stuff. And now he gets this thing. So it's N C K N B C M minus K upon N C M. Okay. Weird. Oh yeah, because it doesn't matter how you like. Okay, the so okay in this scenario, what you can think of is you forget about ordering at all, right? So you're just choosing k from red balls. You're just choosing m minus k from blue balls, and which balls those are that's determining your you know outcome. So in this case, like the outcome is unordered. It doesn't like. Now your outcomes are not tuples. These are now unordered just sets. So, I mean, he just said sample m balls. There, there wasn't the case that like he didn't say you have to do it in a certain order or like not do it in certain order or you can just put them in a bag or something. So you could think of it both ways, okay? And in this way, you're thinking of it as an in unordered way, kind of. 
So what's the title for this thing? Unordered sampling, right? And there is replacement. Sure. This was ordered sampling. There's also unordered sampling, which this was unordered sampling, basically. <laughs> yeah. But he probably also has like an example. No, no. This is the example. It seems. Okay. Fine. Then he does when m is much less than n, then probability of k red balls, which is this thing. Sure, I believe that. That becomes what? So n p m is approximately n power m. Agreed. Because in the denominator there are no numbers. N c k and n c m would approximately be n power m upon m factorial. So like what? You just have n times n minus one all the way to n minus m. N minus m is approximately n. Then you just got like m times of these n things, like n ish things. So n power m. Yeah, it's approximate n power m. I agree. Okay. So this is approximately n power m. Uh, product of n c r k. Yeah. That's n r k fine. Mm -hmm. So he wrote it like this, okay, and that of course can be written like this: n r upon n k, n b upon n m minus k. Weird. Huh? That is weird, isn't it? Wait, that requires the condition that. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. So this would be the case when there is replacement. Now I get what he means by replacements. So, like, okay, in your previous experiment, what the thing was is like you got n r of these red balls and you got n b of these uh few balls. You take one red ball out. Now you have n r minus one red balls, right? What if you take one red ball out and then somebody puts another red ball right then this would be with replacement sure now that makes sense okay then yeah in every take out like in every turn your probability of taking out a red ball is the same it's not changing and then you can do the binary distribution so in yeah so like your outcomes your favorable outcomes are um you know all the tuples now the order does matter because you are taking balls in oh but now like okay these are not unique are they yeah that's a weird thing. now you can't just label these unfortunately because these are gonna get replaced so you'll have to introduce a new label every time and then it's harder to think of it in like in that manner okay so instead of that, you redefine the experiment. So now the experiment is, um, you know, okay, how do I even say this? Uh, yeah, so your experiment is that you will always be getting this, uh, this like bag of NR red balls and NP blue balls, right? Which will be replenished every time you take another thing. Your experiment is you have to take K red balls out of it and then your or, uh, your outcomes will be the tuples right the the tuples of red ball, uh, red balls and blue balls you will get so now the thing is it, yeah like the number of outcomes that you have so now uh, these balls are considered the same they are not unique anymore i kind of get it i kind of get it so now these balls are not unique which is a weird thing. I mean, just in the last question, these were considered unique. And now they're not. It's very weird. Uh, I mean, I get this formula and what it's saying, but this is weird. We changed from the balls being unique to now them being not unique. Um... Hmm. Okay, let's change uh, the experiment a little bit more. So, what you actually do is you take out a ball, 
notice whether or not it's red or blue so now instead of your outcome being a tuple of balls it's now a tuple of letters so letters being like blue red blue red so on that's your outcome okay and the probability of pulling out a red ball once is of course just nr upon n right which is p we just call it as p uh and the n d upon n thing will be one minus p sure then yeah your event is that your tuple that you that you get is having is having k red balls okay what's our sample space so for this experiment your sample space is all kinds of tuples that you could be getting sure wait what no your outcomes are not just tuples of oh no this is bad isn't it wait no this is really bad uh, okay so your outcomes your outcome is not like fine okay okay you still have unique balls you still have unique balls that's the thing seems that's just the case you still have unique balls mhm mm now what are your outcomes yeah so if your balls are still unique what about the replaced balls they will get a different label every time right ah this is weird intuitively this formula makes a lot of sense that you just have you just want to choose k places to put the red balls and then it's like p power k1 minus p power m minus k because probabilities of having k to okay like in k turns you have red balls in m minus k turns you have blue balls so this those probabilities and stuff intuitively this formula makes a lot of sense but then formally this i can't even define what that event is Okay let's go to the previous case what was our event you had distinct balls and then your outcome okay so your um, experiment was just you know to take m balls out of it sure so your outcome would be the tuple of balls with labels on them right so two balls from this array those would be different So like they have labels on them and then yeah that's your tuple but now with the problem that you are replacing these you will have to produce new labels okay how about you just you just put in another ball with the same label as before right or or with like some label related to that So for example if this had this had label 1 then like after putting another one you would have like one dash or something then another one would be one double dash so like there are balls waiting Oh yeah of course instead of thinking of just this batch you could be thinking of something like this you have a whole grid so like nr is actually this thing makes sense right yeah sure that makes sense so number of turns you will be having there that's the number of first slot red balls you have after this first slot of course i guess that could be a way to think about it and then your outcomes are all equally likely i guess yeah Yeah that's one thing you can assume because there's nothing actually stopping it from you know pulling any of these places right uh, include nb as well so each of these places being uh, pulled has the same probability right yeah sure 
So I would say, yeah, it does feel like those are all equally likely something. Wait, no, 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 no. Some of these are just not gonna be happening. Ah, this is weird. Uh, all right, so the label will be the same thing as before. It'll just be replaced. This is... How do you even do this? With replacement, huh? It's not just the last example becoming this example. No, no, no. This is a different thing because the way you will be defining uh, the experiment is different now. Uh, so you could do it like this. You could... So in, what if your experiment is like... It's like this. Okay, you go, you take one ball out of it, right? You note down its label and then you return the ball, right? And so you will have a tuple of labels, not tuple of balls, right? Those balls aren't physically in your tuple. Those are just, you know, the labels on the balls. Sure, that makes sense. And so in that way, you will always have replacement. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's just the thing. That's how it's gonna be. Sure. Of course, that makes perfect sense. So it doesn't even have to be that n approaches infinity, right? Over here you said like m is much much less than n and so that becomes this thing. Doesn't have to be the case. Really doesn't have to be the case. Even if like these are finite number of balls and you have some probability and what you're doing is you're actually replacing this after every time you take it out. Then basically the experiment is uh, is like is like this. You, you have to sample m balls, like a tuple of m labels basically. That's what you want to get as your outcome. In each turn, you will take one ball and then you will return it. You will first notice its label, write it down, and you will return it. And that's how you'll get a tuple of M labels, right? That's your outcome. So now what's your sample space? All the different things that one could get, right? Yeah. Yeah, basically. So the probability of getting some certain label in any out in, in any turn, like all, all of these events of getting some certain label, those are all equally likely, right? Sure. Oh, and then the probability of... Yeah, okay, there's, there's only one way. There's a, Yeah, there's only like one way you can get a tuple of labels. So like if you have, for example, you take three balls and you just get a tuple like this, three, one, two, something like that. The only way you could have got this is that you got two in your first hit, one in your second hit, and three in your third hit. So this is not like repeated anywhere. Which means that all such tuples, distinct tuples of course, all of these have the same probability. Because those are not repeated anytime. Like the probability of this tuple happening is just, you know, the, the probability of getting one in that turn and then two in that turn and so on. Like all these probabilities multiplied which are all the same because you know getting one certain label out of this is just one upon n so it's just one upon n cubed something like that in this case of course you're taking m of this is like one upon m power m right so all of these tuples are equally probable which means sure all you need to do is just figure out how many tuples there are with k red labels and then divide by the number of tuples right yeah which would be like how much so how many tuples are there with k red labels? Um, sorry, uh, k red ball labels. The first you have to choose k positions. So, you know, and you want to take m samples, right? So m c k. Then, um, for those k positions, uh, you want like so like anything with which is a red ball will suffice right any label that's coming from a red ball is going to do it so that's why nr of nr um, power k right and then similarly nb m minus k sure that's the number of um tuples where you have labels from k red balls exactly 
and that upon the total number of tuples that you can get right which is how many um what's the total number of tuples that you can get well in in each place of the tuple you have n things that you can put right so it's gonna be like n power k sure and that's how you get this thing actually so yeah you can think of it as a limit um and you can also think of it as an actual thing so for like discrete things right it doesn't have to be like a like infinitely many balls it just even for finite number of balls with a fixed probability with replacement you will get this thing awesome so no this condition is false i guess it doesn't have to be that n is much bigger than m all it has to be is that there is replacement okay there's the multinomial law n balls in urn and i balls of color i so here it was like red and blue uh, add another color add green right then yeah what's the what's the probability of you know having a tuple of a certain type i guess it's doable sure yeah this is uh, this is very doable in fact it's not all that complicated so yeah, uh, now all you're doing is instead of choosing just k places to put the red balls in, you're also putting, so like you're choosing k1 and k2 places where you want to put the red balls and the green balls, something like that. That's why the multinomial coefficient makes sense. Conditional probability, probability of p equal to 1 upon the probability of p equal to 1 upon the probability of p. What is this? What even is all of this? I don't know, it's some kind of example. I don't want to be doing this. Sample space, I, B, C, events, probability of A. What is even all of this? Bayes' law, okay. Oh, this is the derivation for Bayes' laws. Okay, fine. Uh, this is some example, which I don't know, I'm not gonna do that, I'm short on time. Okay. So you're saying probability of B given A is probability of B intersection A upon probability of A. Makes sense. So given a what's the probability of p mm -hmm. so now your sample space is a instead of uh, s itself right some of them so like some of the outcomes in a will be of different probability so it could be and this is very weird uh is this like the definition or something no it's not the definition All you're doing is just converting the sample space to something else, right? So now your experiment is, you do the experiment, your outcome which was supposed to be in the sample space, you, you exclude the outcomes which are not in A. You only take outcomes which are in A, right? And the probability of each outcome is the same. It's the probability of events that those are different. Something like that, right? So what was the probability of a simple event, by the way? Uh, where is it? Ah, uh, wait, what? No, okay, there was that one thing where you had like different probabilities for different outcomes. So it could be that the outcomes are also different uh, probability. But then how do you define the probability of a certain outcome? Wait, what? How do you do that? Uh, I mean, you just know the probability for that outcome, right? Yeah, so like, okay, if the probabilities are all equal, then that's pretty straightforward to calculate, which is the probability of that particular outcome, that times number of outcomes equal to one. So the probability of that outcome is just one upon the number of outcomes. Makes sense. But when those are not equally likely, then what is the probability? 
I guess you just have to know. So for example, for five, you just had to know that probability is two times every other probability, right? That's weird. So you have to go by intuition sometimes. Huh. So I'll just take this as some kind of definition actually. Yeah, that's all I can do right now. So, <laughs> okay, so instead of Think of this as some kind of formula that you come up with when you assume something. What I'm gonna do is actually think of it as a definition. Is this the right way to be going? I don't know. But yeah, let's just assume it's correct. So yeah, this is the definition probably of uh, B given A. <laughs> because there's no other way that I can think of defining, uh, you know, probability of B given A. fine whatever so then from this you can get the base formula okay so you got this and what that means is like probability of b intersection a equal to probability of a times probability of b given a right or like probability of b given a times probability of a that's better because you had to divide probability of a at first so when you multiply by probability of a you get rid of this upon this stuff that's very nice I mean, notation wise it's very nice yeah okay and then you just equate these so you get this thing and what that means is like probability of b given a is actually probability of a given b times probability of b upon probability of a okay that's Bayes law i mean how would you be using this though i don't know but fine that's the Bayes law so i don't know okay just move on my roommate. Uh, yeah, he's my roommate. Anyway, what is all of this? Okay, it seems this is Fourier series. Why are they doing Fourier series and Fourier transform here? Oh yeah, now I remember some of the discussion we had. So what he was saying is that when you express a function as uh, its components, so it's like its component frequencies, what you're doing is like you're decomposing a certain event into a bunch of like mutually exclusive events right and so the probability of a certain event can be written as some of the properties of all of these events kind of that makes sense right mm -hmm. then he has this thing so not a law of probabilities. What he's saying is the probability of A equal to probability of A intersection of S equal to probability of A intersection of all of that. Yeah, all that stuff using Bayes law and everything. What he basically gets is that probability of A is a summation from I equal to 1 to N of probability of A upon BI, A given BI, sorry, times probability of BI. Right? So, of course, this thing, this multiplication is just probability of. Um, you know, A intersection BI in the sample space itself. So yeah, that's just the thing. And then you can go back and get that, right? So this is like related to the four year series thing, I guess. So like the probability, let's say that the that the function as is, is actually like the probability of, you know, some space A. Wait, I guess I could do better than that. Yeah, I guess I can do better than that. Mm -hmm. Sure. You have this sum over there. Fine. I mean, he does all of that. Oh yeah, okay, this is actually the the actual base rule, isn't it? Sure, so he's saying probability of B i given A is probability of A given B i times probability of B i, which is of course probability of A intersection B i. Or like B i intersection A, that's better to think about it. That upon probability of A, which is, yeah, sure. But then probability of A can be written as this thing. So it's like probability of B i given A is equal to probability of A given B i, probability of B i upon all of this right 
Mm-hmm. I kind of get it. So this is like updating the probability of bi. So if you're going from some space s to a, right, then you update your probabilities. So before your probability of pi was probability of pi, you knew everything. And now say you are going to some other space, some other event, that's your sample space now, then probability of bi given a. That's equal to probability of a given bi. So first we have to know um, that for that particular bi, what, this is weird, isn't it? Yeah, okay. They call it the likelihood. Likelihood of what? Oh, likelihood of A happening in that uh, little block of BI, right? Hmm. Come on, think about it. Hmm. So you have to pull in some kind of input, right? Okay. Fine, and then you have you have all of this thing, which is just the probability of A, and that times probability of BI. How is this related to the four-year series thing that he did? Continuous four-year series. I don't know, but it does look like it's somehow related because you can think of this F as being, you know, the sum of a bunch of probabilities. So. Like when you put a certain t over there, that certain t could be thought of as moving the sample space to something else, right? Yeah. So like, okay, f of t naught is <coughs> so like some sample space related related to t naught. Uh huh. And then this would just be. So this would be the event itself. Okay, the sample space can be written as the event. Uh, it's related to T naught somehow, and that times this thing. Ah, this is weird. I do not know how to interpret this. He's saying that the coefficients are probabilities, something. I mean, sure, I get it that <clears throat> that like S is equal to so like even union and stuff like that. Ah, this is weird. Let's move on. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Sure, I get this thing. This is not all that problematic. I really get this thing. This thing is just probability of A. Right. So that's how you update your probability. Okay. Sure. So it is. It does an example. I'm not gonna do the example. <laughs> it's gonna run next, next, next. What is this multiplication rule? Let a one and a two be uh, two events. Probability of a one intersection a two. That is equal to probability of a two given a one times probability of a one. Okay. Ah, uh, sure. That's that's very correct. Then. Uh, this is congruent to a1 comma a2 what is this what is he doing I don't know a1 intersection a2 intersection a3 I don't know what he's doing what's the final statement okay if a1 a2 all the little an are independent then probably of the union of a1 is the product of these probabilities independent Mm -hmm. Ah, that's that's actually worth looking into. So yeah, like a one happening or not happening, that doesn't alter the probability of a two. So it doesn't matter if the sample space is S or a one. It's so gonna get the same probability, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go for the proof. So first, you write the probability of uh, this. Wait, okay, it's not the union, it's the intersection, sorry. Hey, if it's just the intersection, then hey, then, then we don't have to be looking for it, do we? No, no. 
No, we don't. It seems we don't. Yeah. Doesn't it look like a thing, huh? A1 intersection A2 is just this thing, sure. Also, it's doing something like this. Probability of A3 intersection of A1 intersection A2. So is A1 intersection A2 also mutually exclusive? So, uh, sorry, also independent to A3. Um, I don't know. Uh, so the <coughs> thing is like, okay, <coughs> two events are independent if, if this is our sample space, then this guy's property is still the same, right? Yeah. So like it cuts into half probability basically. Sure. And this also cuts into half of the probability. So you know like these two spaces are equal. Okay. But then probability of A intersection uh so even intersection A2 is probability of A1 times probability of A2, we kind of know that. This is weird. Independent events, how would you think of it? Uh, two certain events are independent. Hey, so what does this mean by all of these events being independent? Are these like pairwise independent or what? Happening in some other sample space, that's weird come on think about it so these two are the same areas and these two also have the same area otherwise this doesn't make sense Mm -hmm. So like okay, this upon the complete area. Uh, no, okay, these don't have the same area. <coughs> it's just five <coughs> minus five. That's equal to this upon this complete area, right? <sighs> okay. So what you're saying is like probability of a intersection B upon probability of a. So I just this thing is a. This thing is B. That is equal to probability of B. I mean, sure, then you can just like, switch these two. This is very unintuitive, isn't it? Okay. Fine. How about A intersection, B intersection, C? So, like, let's add another event C, which is mutually exclusive. So, okay, which is uh, independent to both A and B pairwise. Right? If you somehow figure out an event like that, then... Uh... Wow, this is very weird. So what we have to say is like A intersection B should also be... Yeah, yeah, that has to be uh, independent to C, basically. Come on, think about it. Fine, let's so start doing it. Probability of... I don't wanna do that. So what is he doing? So he's doing like probability of A1, probability of A2 upon A1. That's probability of, okay. Oh, so uh, he's writing a shortened notation for this thing. Right. So A1 intersection A2 is another event. Short, that is probability, probability of A, yeah. Oh, you can actually figure out the probability of A1 intersection. So it's like you just reduced it. So now from three intersections to two intersection or like sorry uh, so two intersection signs to now a single intersection sign that's probably what he did okay makes sense and then of course this thing is just probability of you know a2 intersection of a1 upon probability of a1 right 
and yeah that's basically this thing so you can like okay this is breakable oh so this is the thing um you can do it like this thing a n and then and then this thing uh the intersection from i equal to one to n minus one of a i we want a probability of this so that will just be you know call this complete event as b right so that's just gonna be like probability of uh yeah probability of b times the probability of <coughs> a n given b right yeah and it's just the intersection of this right so this is intersecting with that of course i guess this makes sense sure which is now what so this is just probability of now this intersection from one to n minus one a i so you have reduced this and what about this probability uh so just wait what wait we didn't actually help in any way i mean you have this in the denominator that's not very useful oh come on yeah this is not very useful is it no Think about it. Come on. I don't want to be taking another intersection because that's going to be problematic. <coughs> Oh, but you can change it using Bayes rule, right? You can write it like this thing: probability of b given a n times probability of. I don't think this is gonna be good. It's probably not good. It's probably not good. Yeah, it's not good. He didn't change anything in this case. So okay, that's the that's this probability that the first wrote, and then he wrote this thing. But the problem is like you you have to expand this in denominator. All right, I'll just ignore all of this for now. Oh, so it's like okay, he's going recursively uh, using this. Fine, I get all of that, but what about this? Uh, this is a weird. So if these are all independent for these things, like probability of wait, what? This guy is saying that probability of a n given b is actually the probability of a n itself. That doesn't make sense. Or does it? Uh, let's try doing it like this: probability of a n and the probability of b given a n b given a n it's like updating something right <coughs> yeah updating <coughs> something. it's a bunch of intersections that you're going to be updating Unfortunately, you can't just like, so you can't distribute it. That's not good. Then what can you do? You can't even divide by it. I don't get it. How did he just come to this conclusion? There's no proper proof for this. Oh, oh, so the proof is here. Fine. doing probability of a1 intersection a2 upon probability of a1 mm -hmm. RHS is this thing he says 
probability of a2 is the same as probability of a1 intersection a2 a1 probability of a1. sure that's that's okay but this is probability of a3 that's weird a3 intersection of a2 come on ah. for that you'll have to prove that a2 intersection a1 is actually exclusive to a3 right he's not proving that Distributed, unfortunately. <sighs> no, I don't know. How did he conclude that this thing is the same thing as probability of A3? That <coughs> <coughs> would only happen if A1, A2 was independent to A3, but he didn't prove that. There's probably a better proof somewhere on the net. Fine. And I'm just gonna keep going. Uh, it's gonna be independent to this. I don't like thinking about it in this way. 2D space, huh? Okay. 2D continuous space or something. as well as still the same probability or something like that and then you want to be thinking of like 3d space like i get it it's just adding another dimension to your sample space and that's why it is <coughs> independent because you're slicing so the slices also get sliced well that's weird but that's just the way it is okay visually it makes a lot of sense but like this just does not make sense uh, so is that a definition of mutually uh, like mutually independent events no no i don't think so did you actually prove anywhere that probably of no. like okay that a intersection b is actually independent to c if A is independent to C and B is independent to C. He didn't. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll be the one who will have to prove it. Uh huh. Yeah. Intersection of B. Hey, so we know another thing, right? We know that probability of A union B that's equal to probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of A intersection B. From that you can extract probability of A intersection B, right? That's the same thing as probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of, you know, um, A union of B. Uh, wait, what? No, that goes over here. This comes here. Yeah, okay, this is actually correct. This is actually correct. So, what if, um, what if instead of B, you actually put something like B intersection C? This would just be probability of A intersection B intersection C. That would just be equal to probability of... Wait, it's starting to make sense. Just a little, but it's starting to make sense. What if B intersection C? So if these are independent, then this is just a probability of B plus probability of C. Right, cool minus probability of a union b so in this case it's just probability of a union you know b intersection c so <coughs> wait 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 what was the thing uh b intersection c right yeah right so instead of b you put b intersection c so it's like probability of a plus probability of b intersection c whatever, which is actually not plus it's this thing probability of b times probability of intersection uh, times probability of c union would be splitting but then okay these are not exclusive fine so minus probability of a union b intersection c interesting so you can split this sure it's just a union b intersection of you know a union c we, we did that it's minus probability of this thing sure 
and now we can do the same thing again wait nice so now you know we, we we can actually write the intersection once again so like now this thing will just be negative of probability of a intersection b plus probability of a intersection c minus probability of you know a intersection b um intersection a intersection c right yeah that looks like the case i mean you're taking the intersection with a anyway so it doesn't matter you you can drop this one so now it's just this something like that hey no this doesn't help at all because now i just get just got back <coughs> to this thing <coughs> oh that was not useful that was not useful uh i mean come on just got back to the same thing i do have probably of a times probability of b somehow think think about it Is that it? I don't know. Come on. What even happened? You get something like like intersection wait, what? Is the thing over here? Uh What's the smallest probability of A union B intersection C, which is like A union B? Mm. Wait, let's try it like this: A union B, and then intersection of A union. Distributivity works like that, right? I I think so. Okay, can we somehow prove that these are exclusive or something? I don't know. Uh, hey, this was a thing, right? A and B or C. That's A or B and A or C. I guess. Like for example, if A is false, then that would be completely false. And if this is false, it's like false or B, false or C. Right. But that doesn't make sense. A and what? No, it was A or because A union. Yeah, it was A union intersection C. So. Even if it's false, false, it wouldn't matter. Okay, so this is actually the thing. Now, can I actually split this? A union B and A union C are somehow um, mutually independent. That's our question now. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. <coughs> if they are, you would be able to split this. But we just don't know whether or not you can actually do that. Come on, this is problematic. Uh, think about it. Wait, union won't work because so like think of it as a third dimension. Actually, what you would want to be doing is like a intersection. Right, yeah, it should be an intersection that you should be doing. Not all of this. Wait, then that means all you actually have to do is write probability of a intersection b intersection c as probability of a intersection b that intersection a intersection c. And now these these two events just have to prove that these two are yeah basically independent something like that. Okay, maybe that's doable. Maybe that's doable. Hey, isn't isn't A intersection B basically like B but in A? So you're changing the sample space. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that makes sense. That actually makes sense, doesn't it? Uh huh. Sure. So like, <coughs> the probability of B still remains same. The probability of C still remains same. Even A, but we don't know about B intersection C. Oof! Why is this so complicated? Oh. Come on, think. 
if t intersection c is independent to k then that's gonna work like this this is just not gonna help because we can't go with the assumption that the intersection c is independent to a oof uh, so i guess the way that you would be defining a third event independent to two events is like you have these two events their intersection should be independent to the third event mm -hmm. right and at the same time uh, the remaining parts should also be independent that's the only way right so that you could actually split <coughs> it <coughs> okay weird anyway just move on i will have to search a proper proof for this axioms of conditional probability <coughs> probability of a union b given c is equal to probability of a given c plus probability of if and b are both okay if a and b are mutually exclusive given c mm -hmm. yeah okay now it makes sense i mean that's the way c is defined apparently so c is only uh, considered mutually exclusive if like a is mutually exclusive to c b is mutually exclusive to c and any like how do you even call this a intersection b is also mutually exclusive to c only then is actually c you know independent to wait wait what mutually exclusive wait sorry a and b what what was i even saying yeah okay if a is mutually a and c are mutually independent b and c are mutually independent and their intersection is also independent something like that oh wait this makes sense okay a union b given c sure you can write it like that if a and b are mutually exclusive <coughs> sure. ah this is weird but then a and b are not independent ah whatever okay i don't want to be proving this this is looking doable right oh and c is also not independent or anything this just happens of course this is just a property of you know a union b uh, intersection c all of that upon property of c right which is like what i mean you can distribute this so it's like a intersection c union b intersection c something like that or i don't know it's like a union c intersection b union c uh what even is going on Take a intersection and see something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So probability of a. It's called probability of a intersection C over there. Fine. So this is uh this set can be written as like a intersection C union B intersection C. Sure, that looks about right. Mhm. Mm so since a and B are mutually exclusive, their union. Yeah. Okay. So then these two sets are also mutually exclusive because these are subsets of a and b so then union of that probability of this guy can break this of course as a sum <coughs> makes sense <coughs> okay mm. confusion matrix what what's positive what's positive what is going on I don't know what's going on over here. Some kind of example. Okay, random variable. Discrete random variable. X i equal to capital X of S j. Okay, so S j is a countable set. Fine. You apply some map on it, and then you get. Huh? You get X i. Which are like map to S j somehow. Fine. Okay, continuous random variable. <coughs> Fine. Once again, you apply some map on this continuous, uncountable set, and then you get this thing. I don't know how you are doing it, but you are somehow doing it. Fine. Oh, and we are of course assuming that every outcome over here is like equal probable or something. 
doesn't even have to be it could be like these are different properties actually and then yeah you would have this thing fine discrete random variables property of x is equal to x i okay so it's what this was your actual sample space now you are converting this to an sx space which contains all the x y <coughs> so these are like i don't know labels for every actual event that happened here uh, sorry outcome that happened here something like that okay and we have probability of okay so for each x i you have a certain probability and this is for capital X equal to X I. What even is capital X over here? Hmm. Uh, wait a second. So it's a function, right? So you're gonna give some kind of input over there, of course. Okay, you're gonna give some kind of input. So xi is like, it's just the input. It's it's a number in this space, and then px of xi, that is px equal to xi. This is very confusing notation. Okay, the actual thing it should be is like, so for that particular number, every xi over here that is mapped to that, basically. Yeah every xi that is mapped to that or something like that uh, wait no okay, okay not the not like that wait, wait. oh so xi is being mapped to a certain probability we don't even have to think of this space really we just have to think of xi itself so xi is some number in xx space all right and px of <coughs> xi is the probability that x equal to xi um, and what are our outcomes in this case outcomes are these sj things of course so sj have like so x are like labels for these outcomes so you are asking like what percentage of outcomes have their x as the same thing as xi where xi is the input of course right some number in sx basically so that's also the input for this thing yeah i guess that makes sense right Notation is very weird. They could have just written this in like words and that would have made more sense. So it's the summation of all sj such that it's like okay for all sj such that xi is equal to uh, capital X of sj. Yeah, or you should have written the op opposite things so like capital X of sj is equal to xi basically. So for all those sj such that this happens, you want to sum their probabilities. Sure. Come on, this is like more descriptive than whatever this is, yeah. So X is a certain like I don't know categorization of SJ outcomes. You could also have some other kind of categorization like I don't know you apply some other map on it, capital Y of SJ, right? Okay, so here uh, is an example. So you have these outcomes H and T, it's a coin toss. And then you have a map which is mapping to uh, integers. So capital X <coughs> of S J, it's mapping to one and zero. So H is mapped to one, T is mapped to zero. And then so like one probability is half, and zero's probability is half. So like yeah, the probability of uh, the X from this like okay so from this sample space, uh, the probability that a certain outcome has. Um, x is equal to 1 yeah that uh, is p sub x of 1 which is 1 upon 2 and similarly probability that uh, x value is 0 for certain outcome in our s space that is 1 upon 2 okay properties of pmf okay I mean, yeah in the end it's just a probability so this says this is gonna happen this is the probability of probability mass function right yeah 
two fair coin tosses dependent mm -hmm. burn only random variable okay this is equal to 1 minus p if k equal to 0 and equal to p if k equal to 1 Oh, okay, so it's like a coin toss, but it's unfair basically. What is this bit transfer stuff? I don't know what's going on. So it's an unfair coin toss basically happening over here. So probability of tails is like one minus p, probability of head is p, something like that. Geometric random variable. First success <coughs> in the kth independent trial. <coughs> sure, that makes sense. Binomial random variable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. And this is k is the thing. So like p x k. <coughs> so that is uh, so okay. What would x be in this case? So like okay, what are the outcomes? Outcomes are of course tuples, and x is a certain property of the tuple. In this case, the property is the number of successes in our uh, tuple, right? Or in our sequence of trial or whatever. Yeah, so p x equal uh, probability of x equal to k. That is, what's the probability that number of success is k? Exactly. Yeah, that's what this thing is asking, which is this thing, of course. Poisson random variable. Oh, there's a whole derivation for this thing. Yeah, I was looking at it uh, in the lecture as well. Let's do this. Let's do this. P sub x of k equal to e power negative than whatever whatever what is on the question over here k this is out of m independent infinite trials infinite trials huh so over here what is happening is m independent trials now over here you're gonna have like infinite trials so your tuple is made out of infinite yeah elements basically mm -hmm. And from that you want to choose k uh, trials which are successes and then p power k. Yeah, okay. So basically this thing as m approaches infinity. I get it. Sure. So just limit as m approaches infinity of this complete thing. So it's m factorial upon k factorial, m minus k factorial stuff. But m factorial upon m minus k factorial is just m p k. Upon k factorial, it's a finite number. Uh, then you have property small p power k and then 1 minus p uh, these are of course normal numbers right? yeah I mean I do think these are just normal numbers is that not right wait k success of so exactly k successes that's weird exactly k successes that's gonna be very weird right uh so like one minus p is actually a more dominant thing right yeah so like considering you have like infinite number of trials it's almost certain that you will be getting very small probability of you know um not having successes right so if your probability of success is like something big so like i don't know half or something then the probability of not getting successes of, of failures basically is half and then you're like okay this is going to be very complicated isn't it? yeah so it's like half power k is okay that's finite but then half power m minus k that's gonna approach zero which is not nice because we know that this thing is like oh god this is very weird m minus k okay This is weird. Sure. So if p is finite, then this thing approaches zero. Okay. So like m p k, it's k numbers of size m. So you can think of it as roughly m power k. Okay. Weird. Well, this is an exponential increase. 
Oh, or you can think of like an exponential decrease because one minus p is less than one. And this is a polynomial, so we know for sure that this thing is gonna approach zero. So if p is finite, that's problematic. We're not gonna get anything nice. So the only way would be to put p as something that is infinitesimal, right? So what they are doing is they are setting p to be equal to lambda times m. Okay, let's see what that gives us. So if we do that, just get like m power k. Uh, oh, uh, I get it why it's, why it's like this. Because then, it's like you got this m power k over here, you're gonna get m power k over here as well. And lambda upon m is something that's like very zero. So it's, this is gonna approach something like e. Yeah, okay, I get it, I get it. Uh-huh, sure. So if p is infinitesimal, then this thing is actually the thing that's approaching zero. And this thing is not approaching zero, or it could be approaching zero, depending on the size of <coughs> Yeah, so p should be less than or equal to lambda upon m, where lambda is some finite quantity, so that this would not be approaching uh, zero, right? But if that happens, then like, so like if this is lambda upon m square, for example, then this thing m power k p power k, that's gonna approach zero anyway. So yeah, uh, it's problematic, isn't it? Sure is. Okay. So what do we do? Uh, like okay this thing is actually gonna be either 1 if p is less than like order 1 upon m or it could be like something of e power something if it's order 1 upon m or it could just be 0 if it's order 1 so yeah this is the thing this is what you have to do okay cool uh, so what do you get just get like m power k lambda upon m power k upon k factorial uh, remember k is a finite quantity so this is also a finite quantity and minus p it's like 1 minus lambda upon m that power m okay and then oh so k is finite and this is this is basically order m <laughs> yeah that minus k doesn't matter because you can like pull this downwards 1 minus lambda upon m power k this approaches you know it just approaches 1 because lambda upon m approaches uh, 0 right so that doesn't matter in the end uh well we can cancel this nice and what about this so uh, this is now finite isn't that nice lambda is finite k is finite so just get lambda power k upon k factorial and what about this thing is just uh, i mean this is like you know the you know the way that e power x is defined right it's just limit as h tends to or like okay n tends to infinity or something and then it's like one plus x upon n to the power of power of n something like that right so then this is just that definition but x equal to negative lambda so this will just be e power negative lambda nice put that here right so your you know p sub x of k that's equal to this thing lambda power k e power negative lambda upon k factorial isn't it weird e pops out everywhere like yeah even in like things like boltzmann distribution and all that you get E. I don't know how that happens, but it just happens. Every every single time. Thermodynamics, it always happens. So this is the Poisson PMF. Okay. Whatever. So this is basically just the binomial random variable distribution thing as M approaches infinity. Nothing major, really. Okay. Oh, uh, okay, and like P is an infinitesimal quantity, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Hey, that looks kind of weird. Probability is an infinitesimal quantity. Yeah, this is very weird, in fact. Or it's dependent on k and stuff. Uh, ah, whatever. Move on. Cumulative distribution function. Mm. F of x equal to okay, f x of x. Wow, very nice, very nice notation. 
summation negative infinity to x of oh yes just add all of the uh, probability <coughs> mass function things till certain x value right so that's like asking the question that what's the probability that um, like a certain event in your sample space has uh, x less than some certain input k yeah and x is of course a property of that output in your sample space cool whatever is going on over there i really don't want to look at all of this looks kind of childish doesn't it it's zero okay mm -hmm. whatever <sighs> move on oh so this is the end of the thing right fine properties of this community distribution fx fx is like okay, between 0 and 1 sure i mean just the sum of probabilities but then when you sum all the properties you'll get 1 so yeah it's between 0 and 1 write continuous limit x tends to it's not plus fx of x equal to fx x not yeah it's not plus uh, sure it's right continuous because it's like wait no right continuous this is weird uh, so how is it defined by the way so yeah it's the probability of x less than or equal to x oh okay, okay, okay. I get it so even the ones that are equal to x will be there fine so if this is your thing this is your probability mass function then yeah the probability of capital x less than or equal to x so you want to sum all the uh you know px things till uh you know capital x equal to k or something like that this is kx i don't know what this is so for example if you're talking about one yeah we'll just sum this sum this sum this so on okay all right this is x approaches x plus which is okay from there oh yeah okay because you have already included that so at x naught itself this was included and then you move a bit over here there it's still included so still the same value right look at this at one actually this was uh here so the actual graph would be something like this they didn't draw this correctly so at zero this is not inclusive and this is inclusive so it's one minus p over there and then this is not inclusive at one and this is inclusive and so on right so yeah it's right continuous sure like when you have this sudden jump uh so like at one you're also including uh t sub x of one right so that's why you have the sudden jump over there okay if this was strictly less than then then this would be inclusive and this would be exclusive because after one you are actually going to include one that's going to be weird but yeah okay properties yeah okay got it it's right continuous limit x tends to in, in, uh, negative infinity uh it's zero sure that is you are assuming x is a real number thing or it actually can go to negative infinity but fine whatever it is zero because you're not including anything so yeah and at infinity you're including everything so it's got to be one p sub x of k equal to p uh, x equal to k equal to oh yeah all of this this is probably gonna be important fine so because it's right continuous fine so it's like f x k it's involving k so it's on this interval it's from negative infinity to k and then you are not having this interval so like okay fx k minus this is negative infinity to uh to k not inclusive right yeah so that's gonna be p p sub x of k sure 
that makes sense because like this just gives this set k itself makes sense yeah okay let's try uh, try doing these examples so probability of you know x uh, bigger than a let's not equal to b or something like that also cumulative function is really nice isn't it because yeah so you can just write it as uh, f of b minus so you're gonna include b okay and of course it includes a and everything but you don't want a to be included actually so then you're just gonna subtract a because now this one includes a so you subtract it off now this does not actually have uh, a okay so the second one so property of this thing okay uh, so you're not including b so it's like f of b minus because you're not including uh, b and then minus so you are including a so a minus because yeah Oh, and what's uh, f of b minus is the same thing as f of b minus uh, p of b, right? Because we're just not including b. That's that's the only thing. This would just be f of a minus p of a, and yeah, that's basically this thing. Sure. Yeah, looks looks correct. <coughs> okay, and similarly, we'll get all of this, out, <coughs> which I'm not gonna do. <laughs> okay come on let's just do it uh, let's not use the p thing let's just write it like that so it's just f of uh, so less than b you're not including b okay then you're not including a so you have to include it in the exception thing so yeah that's the thing so it's like this is f of b minus of p of b okay cool what about this one f of uh, so you are including b and then you're not including a so you are wait okay so you are including a so you are not including a in the exception so minus f of a minus so this is of course just f of a minus of p of p so now it's like plus okay plus p of a sure yeah that's the thing okay function of random variables y equal to g of x oh so that's why you actually have this subscript so say the s thing also has another property y which could be i don't know derived from x or something so now it's a function huh? it's a proper function it's not like just a relation i mean okay this is also a relation in fact sure and this was also a function so i don't know why i said it's like a relation what i should be saying like bijic no it's not necessarily bijic it could be like it it maps two different x values to the same y value so okay y is a property of s because it's a property of x and x is a property of s that makes sense right so first you're mapping from s to x it could be many to one it could be one to one doesn't matter and then you're going from x to y so once again it could be many to one or one to one all right so then probability of um yeah so p y of y k so you know having a certain y k so, so like first what you can do is uh, just figure out what's the probability of you know um, so like okay the sum of the probability of all the xi things which which actually are uh, going to give us yk right yeah basically what this sum actually is sure makes sense hey so this is very similar to the last one isn't it uh-huh nice i guess yeah and then this is like this thing is another sum so it's like a double sum that makes sense cool yeah so it's like a double sum so first you would have this summation so uh, which is running over the set of all x i such that y you know what i'm just not gonna use the subscripts anymore all x such that y is equal to g of x and then this is like probability of x xi right which is like what uh, it's just uh, another sum so it's all si or like all s such that all outcomes which have uh, you know x 
x of s i guess yeah is equal to x sure and yeah the probability of uh, those outcomes the probability of s makes sense which is the addition of all of that cool so this is for like discrete uh, variables because it, it uses these sums what about like if these were you know not discrete so these were far <coughs> so like continuous then you would have to use integrals right <coughs> mm -hmm. and you would have to use the probability distribution function which okay they have for some reason not put there for continuous variables uh that's kind of weird fine so <coughs> like how would this be um probability <coughs> of s Oh, come on, this is gonna be very weird. Uh, you would need like dx, dy stuff over there. Come on, think. Yeah, you would basically have to convert this to an integral or something. Wait, no, it's not necessarily an integral. It's more like the summation is. Uh, yeah, another function of it basically. Okay, that's very weird. Mm -hmm. Come on, think about it. Yeah, I don't think of integrals really because you won't be having anything like that. Uh, let's think of something else. Okay, so let's think of I don't know, this is a weird thing. So Say you have like a box of ideal gas and then you have a bunch of molecules, ideal gas of course, and this is moving around in all directions. And for simplicity, let's assume that these are only moving like in x direction, so we forget about the y-z component completely. We could have that, but then it's gonna like involve three dimensions, which I don't want. So, you know, okay, so now you do like an experiment, you just pick one of these, um, you know, one of these gas molecules and notice its velocity right so the kinds of velocities that you could get um, and the molecule that you would get those are the two parameters in our <coughs> outcome <coughs> sure so the prop a, a property of this would of course be uh, the velocity itself so you know this is mapped to our SV space yeah and that velocity could be mapped to an energy space like this sure where energy is of course half mv square so m is a constant which you don't need to know <laughs> mass of the molecule of course uh, okay <coughs> so having the probability um, wait it's kind of weird isn't it uh huh. Okay. Uh, okay. What's the probability distribution function for this thing? So, like, what basically we are asking is for a certain range from e to e plus de. How many elements? Sorry. Uh, how? How do you want to say this thing? Yeah. So, like, for those, for for that certain range, what is your dse? Okay. What's ah? It's very weird. What's the probability? of this thing like what's the probability that you know your outcome is gonna have this energy in this particular range basically yeah that's that's what you'll be asking mm -hmm. so you know i'm just gonna call it like this probability of e to e plus d uh d very weird but that's just the way it is um so our probability distribution function would just be this thing upon de right you could have like some cumulative probability distribution the difference of that so it's like d of f e something like that right you could write like this thing you can sure like it <coughs> write it like that so that so that it makes more sense but i'm just gonna write it like this <laughs> and what's that gonna be um okay so what we'll think of is like okay this interval can be thought of as like a bunch of values so for some certain e what are the v things which could be mapped to that e it's of course you know 
like you just get v equal to plus minus uh, square root of 2e upon m right yeah so we'll just get like two uh, v values that are actually mapped to this thing okay and what v values are mapped to this region like what's the region of v that is mapped to this that's one thing that you could ask me. Oh, this is of course a probability of E, like subscript E, so that you know E lies in that range. This is the same thing as probability of V. Um, you know, one thing could be that it is uh, lying in this range, that it's yeah, like negative square root of two E upon M, or like I should say, E plus T plus that's a more negative value, so like. 2 times of e plus de that upon m right uh, to you know, square root of 2 times of e upon m right that's one range which is mapped so this is weird because like in discrete uh, probabilities you were mapping <coughs> elements to to uh, different elements right in this case you are mapping range so like a range of elements to another range of elements and that's completely okay right yeah you, you could like think of it as a many to one map and also like squeezing things together or something like that right so yeah it's completely fine in fact and i hope it is <coughs> sure like the probability being in this is the same thing as that right uh, it's still weird isn't it but yeah this is basically the thing so it's just you know this thing oh uh yeah okay this is usually the probability distribution function isn't it like this is the probability distribution function sure okay so you like you, you have to keep that de there because otherwise this would be uh, a not finite quantity this would be like going to infinity or something so you got this it should be negative with it and you also have pv you know square root of 2e upon m all the way till square root of 2e plus de all of that upon m right yeah and um this probability thing that upon uh, de so the de is just the half mv square so you can write this as mv so you could do something like that right so now you have went so now you have like converted from e to v and then you would like figure out what these probabilities are fill them in and you get it oh it should be a two yeah okay, it should be like dv over there fine <coughs> that looks like the thing huh yeah yeah that looks like the thing yeah right and then you can like figure out that you know what is the probability of this interval and stuff we know this is it's just it's just this thing it's uh d f v is evaluated at negative square root of 2e upon m upon m v d v right i mean that's just what like this is isn't it for this interval, what you're basically doing is like uh, taking the cumulative probability at this point minus the cumulative probability at this point. Don't like worry about inclusive, exclusive. It's a range, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> and you're taking the probability of that, and it's like infinitesimal quantities. You're taking derivatives, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, and then you got d f v related at this thing square root of two e upon m upon m d d v. Makes sense, right? Yeah. Cool. Sure, so you're gonna be doing something like that. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so that's it. I guess I'll see you guys next video. Bye.